Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Side. Uh, today, what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at Maurice Lacroix watches. And uh, the subtitle is uh, Gems or Junk. And it should probably be Gems and Junk because there's some really interesting things and there's some other things that are that reflect, I, I should say, a lower price. Okay, well, uh, the reason I was coming out here today is that behind me my uh, pear trees are in blossom, so I thought it would be sort of nice. We have an overcast day. It's a little cool for spring. And over here are my cherry trees. They're also in blossom, so I thought this would be a, this would be a nice day to, to come on out here and uh, talk about watches. Uh, to get started, uh, I want to talk about Daniel Mueller's uh, Speedmaster, Man on the Moon. Uh, I saw this on one of the um, on, on one of the Facebook uh, the Watch Facebook pages, and I thought, well, this would be an interesting uh, uh, one to have. By the way, too, I got a pocket square from uh, FP Journe. I was over there the other day at the uh, boutique. And they gave me one of these. This is, uh, by the way, too, we got squirrels and other critters out here. So there's a squirrel right there who's thinking of photobombing me. And we also have wild turkeys, so I have no idea what's coming up here. Raccoons. We had a raccoon the other day during the day. So, And we have bears. So the bears usually don't come out during the daytime. The, uh, the Speedy, uh, the Speedmaster that Daniel has is a beautiful example. It's just, it's just gorgeous, and uh, I think it's the coolest uh, watch of the week we've had in a while. And it's so, I, I mean, the term iconic is so overused with watches, but uh, in this case, uh, it applies. Starting to rain. I better go inside anyway. <laughs> Hi again. Well, I'm uh, back out from the cold and the rain. <laughs> So anyhow, uh, today what I want to do is talk about a watch company that is, is, is very interesting. And the question that I originally had is, well, is Maurice Lacroix really been sort of kicked around a little too much? And maybe they're better than we think because they've got a lot of good watches or a lot of good looking watches. And so what I thought we ought to do is take a look and find out if they really have good movements that go with their watches. And the answer is yes and no. <laughs> On the one hand, they do have their own in-house movement. They have quite a few of them. And on the other hand, they have a lot of other watches that are, I don't know whether they're going to sell out the stock or not, but they have a whole lot of them that are... You know, they're not expensive uh, movements, and they're certainly not in-house movements that they tossed in there. So let's take a look. Now, we're going to start with Andreas Strahler. And Andreas Strahler, you may not have ever heard of his watches before, but he's the kind of guy like... Um, Roger Smith and um, uh, Philippe Dufour and, and some of these other independent, very, very good watchmakers who make a few watches every year and uh, these watches sell in the $100,000 and up range. Now the question is, is uh, why would we want to start with him? Well, first of all, let's take a look at one of his watches. It's called the uh, Sartorella Lune Perpetuelle. And it's a very precise moon phase watch <laughs> with a precision up to two million years. Now, <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. And because of his precision, because of the kinds of watches he does, uh, he's one of the top. Well, what does this have to do with Maurice Lacroix. Well, in 2007, uh, Lacroix went to Andreas and said, hey, um, 
We want a new movement, and we want it to sort of have the character. <laughs> I don't know how what a character, but sort of the 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 look of a Venus 175. Now, Venus 175 is a very old movement, and it was, but it was something that has a lot of sort of what we'll say flair to it, and yet he wanted to do it, but in improve the the movement characteristics. Okay, now this is what he wants. So he went to uh, Andreas Strahler and said, "Could you do it for me?" So um, Strahler started uh, working on it and. Uh, the going back and forth between uh, Lacroix and Strahler, the the process led to what was called the ML 106. Uh, ML standing for uh, Maurice Lacroix. Okay, so what happened is very interesting. Uh, one of the things I'm going to read to you this is a this is an email. Uh, from uh, Andrea Strahler. Uh, some collectors were asking about it, and this is the email he sent. He said, the Venus 175 had problems, uh, like too small a size, so there was less inertia, less resistance to shock. And taking too much time to assemble, it took about eight hours to put one together. Now, since Maurice Lacroix had experienced with the Unitas 64, 97, and 98 before, and already had lots of cases designed for them, they wanted to make a movement based on the Unitas this time as well, but under the condition of aesthetically similar to the Venus 175, but with improved uh, kinematics. Um, and so, okay, so this was <laughs> what he, so he, so he went back to work on it. You see, so Andreas developed the ML-106, which were more reliable, easier to assemble, and more flexible with sizes. When, when he showed the first prototype uh, to Roland Berger, uh, the head of the complication watchmaking at, um, and technical department at um, uh, Lacroix, uh, the guy said, he says, this is the best prototype I've ever seen in my career. You see, uh, and so this, I mean, there must have been a really awesome movement. Now, the conclusion is this, is that Andreas had to design a movement that is visually similar to the Venus 175, but had the sort of modern day kinematics that had been improved. Okay, so it turns out that this movement, the uh, Lacroix movement, the ML-106, uh, it, it had other features in addition to it. It had like an elegant uh, swan neck uh, precision adjustment, a regulator, and then had two genuine gold chetons in the chronograph bridge. All right, so this is what uh, Strahler made for Lacroix. So now Lacroix, I mean, this, he designed it for him and then uh, Lacroix went to work on creating it in-house. All right, so that, so when, when Lacroix got serious about hierology, he went to the very best. Now, this may sound something like what uh, Harry Winston did. Harry Winston went to Agenhor and Dubuis. And so this was sort of a very similar and a very interesting route. So let's take a look at uh, some Lacroix watches and try to separate the gems from the junk. He's got both. Uh, I, I got to admit that I found something, at least had, I, I think, a fairly... Mm, I don't know if it's questionable, but perhaps movement in it that I really like the design on. Okay, so let's take a look at the um, uh, these watches that came out of this. Well, the um, the first one uh, that was with the 106, it was called the one of the ML 106-2 from Lacroix, and it was a 2007 uh, Grand Prix entry. It didn't didn't win anything, but 
that's okay. <laughs> it was there. And it was called the Masterpiece Le Chronograph. And so, you know, here you've got a really serious piece of horology by a company that you used to throw in a Salida or an ETA or whatever was around. All right, so uh, this is the first part of it. And a watch like this is a seriously good watch. Now, what Lacroix did, which is I, as a lot of watch companies do this, and it just aggravates the daylights out of me. And that is just it's going to be a limited edition. I, I'm not even sure why they do it. Uh, maybe they do it to test the wind to see if it sells. But, I mean, they're not limited in a sense like uh, Roger Schmidt, who only makes 11 or 10 or 11 watches a year are limited. Uh, but they're limited because of some some suit makes a decision they're saying well you know can we make more money per watch if we if we if we have a smaller uh oh i don't know what production run on them okay uh well they did that with them which i thought was sort of dumb uh but but they had a reasonable price uh and the prices weren't crazy they didn't start they don't want you know over twenty thousand dollars or anything like that and most of the other watches they were competing against were at that level. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at uh, one of the things, the the swan neck. This was something that the um, that the original, well, I, well, both the Unitas and the Venus 175 didn't have. It didn't have a swan neck regulator. And you can see what where the term swan neck came from. Right? There's a picture of a swan neck, and it has a duck, and then there's a, the swan neck regulator. Uh, by the way, too, this is something, and I gotta admit this, I was using um, the uh, Ryan's book uh, a good deal, and this, this one right here, I mentioned it before, there is a very good section on distribution and regulation uh, in, in this handbook. In fact, when I was looking at it, there was this one that had a double swan neck regulator. Uh, anyway, go to page 64 if you have the book. If not, um, it's available. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so, so, so now we have Lacroix is not tossing in something of dubious nature. It is using sort of some of the older kinds of sizing and casing and so forth that they're more familiar with, with this, oh, I guess it's, it's sort of like a the Venus 175, the Unitas uh, 6497 or 98. Okay, now, one of the things that it has, uh, and again, this is for 2007, even though it was 10 years ago, it's a long time after that they had these earlier uh, mechanical watches. Now, it beat, it had 18,000 beats per hour, okay, and modern ones are easily twice that. Uh, so, th this was not a fast watch, but, and it was a pretty big size movement. Now, the bigger the movement, the more things you can do with it well. And uh, one of the complaints is that some watches they have, like this one, has a pretty big size, but the movement isn't should be a little bigger inside. You don't want to have a you know big one with a little bitty movement in it. Uh, this one's got a big movement and it's a big watch. Okay. Uh, also, piece of knowledge I just found out while I was doing this: the swan is the national bird of Ukraine. All right, well, let's move it right along. Um, here is one from its uh, caliber ML192. And it's called the Masterpiece Moon Retrograde. So here you have a couple things. There are several things, as a matter of fact. You have a, a retrograde for the date. You have a retrograde for the, um, it looks like a second hand. <laughs> oh, wait, no, those I think are days of the week. Yeah, there's a circular one for days of the week, and inside of that is a, a moon phase. Uh, and this is another uh, one of the uh, uh, 
Lacroix uh, movements in it, the ML192. So it does a lot of stuff. Now, one of the things that I found out, like so many others, like Cartier, like IWC, like Omega, like you name it, uh, Breitling, uh, they, they're very vague when it comes to movements that are of the lesser mark, we'll say, okay? As they're throwing some Salida or ETA in. Uh, they're very noisy about when they put their own movements in, but somebody else's they're mm, not so loud about. These guys are doing the same thing. This really makes me very unhappy. Uh, the I think it's the uh, one of the uh, ETAs uh, that they had. Um, the ETA 2894-2. Now it runs at 28800 beats per hour. Okay, that's that's a good deal more than the eighteen thousand uh, that the um, uh, ML uh, one hundred six has. But one of the things I found out when I was looking at these, uh, they most of them were part of this in-house uh, legitimate one. And one way you could tell is that they were all eighteen thousand bph. Now here, this modern watch with their in-house movement that's thumping away at. 18,000 instead of 28,000 or 36,000 or something like that. So in going through there, when they were vague, very vague about the movement, I checked the beats per hour. If it were 18,000 beats per hour, okay, that's probably in-house. If it were 28,800, I think they snuck in something. They snuck in an ETA or a Salida that had cloned an ETA. So you have some really neat stuff here, but they're doing the same stupid thing that all of these other high horology uh, watchmakers are certain they're not high horology. Really, most of them are sort of middling horology. Uh, like Cartier has, they'll have, one of them will be a quartz, one of them will be a, a, a ETA, and one will be a caliber de Cartier, which is really a nice movement. And but they they're vague on all of them except the caliber de Cartier, and then they 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 tell you exactly which one that is. Um, okay, uh, so let's see what else they got here. Um, here's another one. This is a double retrograde. They're really big for retrograde. It has its own movement. The ML one ninety one, another in house one. By the way, too. Um, the Masterpiece series is the only one. They've got four or five series of watches, but it's the Masterpiece ones are the only ones with the in-house movement. And even some of them are mm, maybe not uh, to in-house. Okay, uh, so here's a double retrograde. They've got some interesting kinds of things that they're doing with it. Um, this uh, this next one is one I really like. Now this has its own in-house movement. This is a, a ladies' watch. It's called the Power of Love. And they have, one of the things that um, uh, Lacroix does that I really like is that they have these little gear things. Now this one has a little love that spins it around, and um, I thought it was a pretty cool watch <laughs> myself. I something for my wife. It is expensive though. Some of these other ones. Now this one was like $14,000, which is way, way over what your typical um, uh, LaCroix is. But it's interesting though, that's, that's important. Okay, now we got something here. This was one the um, LaCroix had put in a lot of watches and they never <laughs> it never made it to second base. Well, there was one that did, and I'll talk about that later. But uh, this one did, and uh, this was called their Masterpiece Seconde Mysteries Use. <laughs> and it was um, it was one of the uh, men's watches that was pre-selected in 2013. Now, what that means is that of all of the watches that were entered, they take out, I think, five for each category, and these are called the pre-selected watches, and this was one of them. So uh, it's it's a sign that uh, Lacroix was is really starting to move up because you know they don't <laughs> the people who are judging these things you're not going to pull something on them they they're going to know what the movement is 
And um, they saw this, they said, hey, this one passes muster on it. Some of the other ones they entered didn't, didn't have the kind of quality they were looking for. And they never made it, like I said, they never made it to second base or first base, actually. Okay, so, so here was another sign that something was changing at LaCroix, or changing for the good, in my opinion. All right, now here's one. This one is sort of interesting. They have a caliber called ML, and then it's a 150. Now, supposedly, these are in-house movements, supposedly. Uh, the 159, the one that I found, I found extremely interesting. Uh, it was a Maurice uh, Lacroix masterpiece, sink, egg wheel, caliber 50 uh, ML uh, 159. Now, the sink, egg wheel is five hands, <laughs> right? And I looked at that, I thought, how cool is that? What they did, the, the outer ring with a hand that uh, reaches it, is the days of the week and then uh, coming in you have uh, the the months and uh, then you have a uh, let me see where I say oh, the, the uh, days of the month and then you have the time and it does it with five hands and I just thought oh no that's very cool and but it's a very good price too that was the other thing I liked about it so with Lacroix <laughs> it's not that difficult to figure out which ones are in-house and which ones are not. But they do have some interesting things going on and there are a lot of bargains. A lot of these things brand new are under a thousand dollars and of course on the used market they're a lot less than that. So you can find some very interesting things but you really have to do your detective work to find out whether they're of uh, the, the in-house movement or something else. Okay, the final one that I wanted to uh, take a look at, this is a, a lady's watch. They actually won the public prize at the Grand Prix de Orlogie de Geneve in 2008. Now, the public prize is what the, what the people like us, the lumpen proletariat, will throw in as the ones we like the best. And um, it's more of a popularity contest, I think, than a horological one. Uh, and this, I gotta admit though, this is a very cool looking watch. Uh, God knows what kind of <laughs> movement they have in that one. Uh, by 2008, they did have their 106, and it could have been the 106, but uh, I, I, I looked at the uh, description that they had for uh, the Grand Prix, and they somehow neglected to mention the movement at all. And when that happens, it's probably one of the, one of the uh, lesser movements that's around. Okay, well, th uh, that, was, <laughs> that was it for, uh, uh, for Lacroix. I think Lacroix is one that has, it's got this crazy mix of things, some of which are very inexpensive, but they still have a lot of interesting uh, innovations. That five-hand one I thought was was very interesting. And in order to get it to work that way, they, you know, they got to do some. They have to put in some, at least some modules that are interesting. And so, the qua is something that may be what I think we're all looking for is affordable high horology. Um, We'll see what happens with it. A lot of these other ones, a lot of companies have gotten away with murder, in my opinion, by putting in uh, cheap movements when they do have their in-house movements that are perhaps more expensive. But hey, if you're gonna you're gonna charge high horology or even strong horology prices for a watch, you better have something in there worth paying for, not something that was that came out of a mass-produced in a you know in a factory down the road. Okay, well, I'd, I'd like to hear your opinions on this, what you think. And like I said, if you're thinking of getting one, do your research. And, and one of the easiest ways to spot something that is in-house, it'll be 18,000 beats per hour rather than one of the fast ones. Okay, well, um, oh, and by the way, this is, a, this is an invitation to subscribe if you'd like. We'd love to have you. And... Um, 
We'll see you on Sunday with our next uh, collection review. Bill Sanders for Watch Art Side, the art and science of Watch Collection.